Northern Ireland, a small step to a giant adventure. Book your next giant adventure at discovernorthernireland.com. How you all doing? I'm Mary Ellen Campbell. I'm the coordinator of the LGBT Heritage Project. Um, I'd like to welcome us all and thank you for all taking the time to t join in this evening. I'd also like to thank Phil and Fobble for including us in part of their festival. As I said, I think it gets bigger and better every year, and I'm not just saying that because we're in part of it this year, um, but it is. <clears throat> so this evening, we're, we're going to chat with Cara McCann. Cara is the director of Here and I. And just before I introduce Cara, I'd like to give you a wee bit of information about our project, the Heritage LGBT and I project. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and pull up our wee database or our wee presentation. I do this all the time. So our project is in uh, collaboration of Here and I, the Rainbow Project, and Cara Friend with Here and I being the lead partner. Um, where to find us online at LGBT History and I. So we're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Please, if you are uh, tweeting this evening, can you use the hashtag Pride? Um, we would really appreciate that. So as I say, tonight we're going to uh, chat with Cara McCann. Cara is the director of Here and I. And just before I, I speak to Cara, tonight's talk, we're really looking at Pride what pride means to Cara. Um, I have pulled up a wee photo there of Here and I staff, minus myself, <clears throat> at uh, the last physical pride we were at in 2019. So Cara, do you want to start and tell us a wee bit about yourself? Yes, thank you, Mary Ellen. Thank you for all your hard work in organising this. And Thank you so much to everybody that's logged in. Um, I didn't think I would be as interesting, but you can let me know towards the end of the talk. Um, so really just about myself, I was asked to do this because um, I'm from West Belfast, born and bred, um, and I'm the director of Here and I. So really a wee bit about myself. Um, when I was born, I lived in Anderson's Town. And then when I was about four or five, we moved to Poglas. Um, we were the very first ones, and saying that to Mary Ellen earlier, we kind of made history. We were the first ones to move in to Poglas, and my mummy to this day still lives um, in the same house. Um, I am married to my lovely wife, Amanda, who's on screen now, um, and I have a big son who is 28 this year. Um, yeah, love West Belfast. I am West Belfast out and out. And again, really, really proud to be doing this event tonight. Um, so Mary Ann Ellen's prompted me with some more um, slides. So I'm going to take her lead. Um, I suppose I was a really young mummy. Um, again, my son's 28. I was 17 when I was having him. And I think quite often, especially in the 90s, it was difficult and, and people quite often write you off if you're a young mummy, well, that's your life over and that's it. Um, but I was never brought up to go to university. Um, my parents never went, but education was always something that I really valued. So I suppose if it wasn't for West Belfast and the community development ethos within West Belfast, I probably wouldn't be where I am today. Um, so when I got ran up to Toddler, I went back to Footprints Women's Centre in Poglas, and I was a previous board member there. Um, and I carried out a two-year foundation course in women's studies and then got a real love actually for the subject. Didn't think of university and didn't apply. And then when I got my results that day, they kind of kicked me up the street to Queen's and says, go and see, can you apply late? Um, and I applied and got in to do my degree and still had a bit of imposter syndrome looking around going, my God, I can't believe I'm here. Somebody will come to me and say I've made a mistake. Um, so I done my degree there for three years. Um, and then went back after I finished my degree to teach in Queen's for quite a number of years on their sociology and women's studies course and social policy. 
Then I'm back and done a master's in women and gender studies. So, yeah, if it wasn't for food prints and community education, I, I, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to progress to university. Tara, so you've done women's studies? Mm-hmm. Oh. I'm just going to ask, is there any lesbian in Some. that you would really um, admire? Sorry, Marianne, could you repeat that? Yeah, could people put their machine on mute, please? Um, I'm just asking, when you talked about women's studies, it kind of brought into my head, would you have anybody, either historically or more modern, uh, um, an LB woman that you would really admire? Apart from yourself and having the deputy mayor post and raising our visibility in our city, I must say um, Marie Query and Co were the first kind of cohort of women that kind of looked at having an LGBT organisation specifically for lesbian and bisexual women. So, yeah, I really admire those women that started off our organisation. I suppose a bit of historical context when we weren't always called here and I. Um, originally, we were called LASI, and that stood for Lesbian Advocacy Services Initiative. I went for the interview, and that was probably a year later the name of the organisation was changed because when I uh, said I worked for LASI, people just had this blank expression when I explained what it was, and they were like, oh, is that like with dogs, like Lassie dogs, or go Lassie, go? People just didn't get the name and then we rebanded the here and I. So yeah, I would say Mary and those other women with Mary that kind of originally started up the organization. Yeah, I would agree. Mary's class. So are you. And I thought you were going to say Amanda there myself, but sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> so tell me then you were talking there about uh going to Queens and being a young mummy. Um and you mentioned Ryan. Mm-hmm. Um I Rand's been a really great ally of, of all LGBTQ plus people. I've seen him on, on Facebook and I've seen him on social media, taking down some um, of those, let's say, less enlightened people. Um, how's he doing these days? He's doing great. And, you know, as a mum, we were all proud of our children, but I really am proud of mine. Um, and as you say, Miriam, he's such an advocate for, for a heterosexual man, you know, for our community, such an ally. Um, but he's doing great. He um, is a tattooist, has his own wee shop, um, Stay Gold, give him a shout out, <laughs> in the Springfield Road. So he he works in West Belfast and is a business owner in West Belfast. But yeah, he has been to marches and fully supports every single thing that we do. That's great. Uh, and it's his partner's. Uh birthday today so we'll throw out a wee happy, happy birthday to Diana um, and also I know that the both of them are getting married next year um, and I have to say for myself one of the proudest uh, times I seen Ryan was at your, your and Amanda's wedding yeah. it just looks so delighted um, and, I, and I, I, sorry I remember Ryan saying you know when we were campaigning quite heavily for marriage equality here it really used to frustrate him because he said you know Ryan and Dana's getting married next year. And he said, this is something that I really take for granted. He says, you shouldn't be having to fight for something that you should just be able to do the same as me. You know, so that did, that did upset him quite a lot that we didn't have the same rights as him. And Cara, see, but just before we, we bring you into here and I's more modern history or recent history, tell me what else you've done before you come into here and I. I mean, the, the idea of this talk tonight is pride and your concept yeah. of pride. And I know of them we've chatted about it when I persuaded you to do it. Uh, one of the things that I used um, to persuade you was you being a local West Belfast woman. Mm-hmm. You know, tell me about that. What is the kind of coming from West Belfast that you're most proud of? I, I absolutely love West Belfast. Um, I suppose starting with community education and um, before I went to university, I had a real love for community development and developing my own community. Um, one of my first jobs coming out of university was with the West Belfast Partnership Board working on health projects and that gave me a real good overview of the West and all the organisations that are in West Belfast. I also managed um, a project in the Frank Gillen Centre that's just down near the town actually at the bottom of the Falls Road uh, and again that was an eye-opening experience. Um, but then I moved from 
community development and, and the West where I lived, I suppose, to community development within the LGBT organisation. I would say probably 13 or 14 years ago, there was a coalition, the Coalition of Sexual Orientation. It was COZO. And there's some people here that might have remembered that. And I was lucky enough to get um, a year-long funded post with that. And I'll never forget it. I just started the job, and that's when Aris Robinson came out with her horrendous um, homophobic remarks. And I was only in the job a week, and the phones were going mad. And I was like, how do you even deal with this? But it made me feel a wee bit better because her husband was first minister at the time and the funding came from his department to fund me. So that actually cheered me up. Um, so it, then I got a real love of, of the LGBT sector and, and working to progress LGBT rights. And I suppose I kind of was able quite often to intertwine that in West Belfast um, and to take part in different events. And when I worked in West Belfast, you know, I was encouraging that the organisations take uh, sexual orientation awareness training, you know, and that our message and the message of LGBT struggle was was kind of very evident in West Belfast. One, one of the other, then we then bring Pride into an LGBT um, sense. Tell me <clears throat> your thoughts on Pride. What does it mean for us? I suppose pride means different things for, for, for all different people, you know, but for me personally, I think it is a day of celebration. It's celebrating our diversity, it's celebrating who we are, and it's also celebrating the achievements that we've kind of and the fights that we've won in the past. But I think more importantly, it is still a form of protest. You know, we have come over so many hurdles, but we have so many more hurdles to achieve um, and, and that's legislative change and kind of within our community. So I would say for me, it's a mixture of protests and celebration, but I think it's a brilliant day for us to celebrate our community, for our families and friends to come with us. And I think even within our local community, spreading kind of the LGBT love and what our issues are. That's great. Uh, and I hope you don't mind me digressing very slightly. We'll show you. Yeah. you know, when me and you sit down to chat that I go off on all sorts of different times. <laughs> so you're, you're used to after it by now. But one of the pride to me also is, is a film um, about Mark Ashton and Jude, who, who's one of our volunteers, has worked an awful lot um, to get a blue plaque up in Portrush. But I've just noticed that Mike Jackson has joined us. And Mike obviously is a friend of Mark Ashton's and was also very instrumental in keeping um, Mark's uh, memory alive. So hello, Mike. Um, just wanted to throw that in there. Um, and I think you're no stranger to Belfast either. I know you're eating there, Mike, so sorry for throwing you into the deep end, but it's okay, I'll, I'll ask you a question at the end if that's all right. I've just finished eating, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> hello. <laughs> How are you doing? So, Cara, if I then bring you back to, to Pride again, uh, to me, you see, I always think of Pride as that kind of protest. And you talked about working in West Belfast. Were you out when you were working in the West? I remember when I first, a bit of a funny story. Um, I, I was out, but I had literally just started one of my jobs. And... Um, <laughs> My partner at the time was, was quite ill and got brought into hospital and I was at the hospital all night and went into work the next day as you do because he just started a job and I was afraid of losing the job. And the boss said, oh, what's wrong with him? And I kind of looked and went, okay, I'm just in this job a couple of days, but you know what? I just said, well, actually, my partner's a she. And... The boss went, oh, that's okay, turned purple and went, take as much time as you like, just go on ahead and go on and go home. You know, I think it was a sense of embarrassment for him because he just presumed my partner was a man. But yes, I, I was totally out in West Belfast and felt totally safe to come out and was very accepted. Um, you know, and we're talking about Pride and West Belfast, you know, that's what I said earlier, you know, Fela for many, many years has supported LGBT events and have invited us to do several events and be part of the parade, which I think is amazing. You know, LGBT rights isn't just for Belfast or Derry. 
it's our geographical areas where we live. It's so important for visibility. And I think one thing that stands out for me, a couple of years ago when I was driving up the Stewartstown Road, there was nothing as affirming as saying big marriage equality posters up on every lamppost. You know, I'm like, that. that is just amazing. This is the area where I live and there's marriage equality now posters up. You know, another example is the Queer Kelly at the Marty for Safe. Um, Dominic Montague wrote that, an amazing play, if anybody hasn't seen it. Um, and it's all LGBT based. And I was sitting in a bar in West Belfast watching that about two and a half years ago, going, I can't believe this. You know, this is just utterly amazing. Um, and again, I said to Mary Ann today, talking historically, I think it must be 17 or 18 years ago, there was a the launch of a report and it was in the Cutterland and um, the Falls Road. It's an LGBT report. And I think it was specifically for lesbian and bisexual women. And 17 or 18 years ago, that, that was a big deal. And I remember going down to the culture line going, can't actually believe this. There's an event about lesbian and bisexual women, and it's a black taxi drive away from where I live. You know, just amazing. I'd say that was about 17 years ago. But then that was that was a massive thing. Absolutely massive thing. Yeah, I, 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 as I said to you today, I remember first meeting you actually in an event in Conway and Mill. That Robert Homer spoke at, and both of us can't remember what year it was, but I, oh. I reckon it was the very early 2000s. Um, so for me, it was always great when, and it still is, when I see any local area doing LGBT plus events. Um, it is that type of thing, is this is my home too, I'm here too. Most definitely. We chatted earlier about the different um, camp campaigns or different issues that you ha helped highlight over the years um and I, I know we have photos here of the marriage equality campaign which was quite quite a big campaign and there's yourself with danny and the reason i have this photo up um and i think i may have nabbed it off his facebook um is yourself and danny i know he was murdered there and he'd have fitted the marriage equality campaign into city hall um which again is first First citizen of the city was quite <clears throat> important, but he now works up in Lagmore, and I believe himself and yourself were instrumental in doing a parade event up there. Well, I can't take any credit for that, Marianne. Um, I am the chair of Lagmore Youth Project, and that's something that's really close to my heart. And I see the main man from Lagmore Youth Project here, Colin. Hi, Colin. Thanks for joining us. I must say, and people think. Like more Youth Project has staff because of the volume of work that they actually do. We don't have any staff. That's that's the honest truth. We're not funded with any staff. It is 100% volunteer run. But you know what? When I Colin approached me about coming on the board and their work's amazing and didn't have to think twice, but something that made me utterly, utterly just so proud was that we have an LGBT group within Like More Youth Project. And that has 30 or 40 kids that attend that regularly. And we are at capacity now. And you know what? Something like that five or even 10 years ago was unthinkable. Kids go out their front door and go around the corner and can access the service. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's so important. You know, here and I and, and our sector colleagues, you know, we provide services in Belfast City Centre. But you know what's really, really important? That LGBT people have the confidence to access services in the community where they live. I think that's something that's really, really important. And do you know what? It was about a couple of weeks ago, Lagmore Youth Project on um, a rainbow colour run for, for Pride season. And uh, there was hundreds and hundreds of people. And Danny was one of them. Multicolour paint and all sorts over him. But you know what? That was a real fun event for our community, for our local community in Lagmore. But that really highlighted Again, the importance of visibility for LGBT people. Yeah. It was amazing. I, I love this photo too. Um, and part of the reason I threw this up is I never got a piece of this cake. Um, but <laughs> Amanda, Amanda said it was lovely. This is uh, in the merchant, doesn't it? It is, yes. Um, I suppose the story around that, and it may not make you feel as bad, Mary Ellen, I'll let you all into a secret. My lovely wife made that cake. But there's nothing inside it apart from polystyrene. Oh, so you didn't really you didn't really miss much out to, to fake cake. She made 
Um, I suppose that probably brings us naturally on to the marriage equality campaign. That's something I'm really, really passionate about. I was and still am really passionate about. Um, and it did come with its challenges as well, you know. Uh, you know, as I said, I have a son and there was many times where I said to him, this is going to hit the media and be prepared for some negativity. But just on the historical aspect of, of how we got kind of marriage equality here, we had a, a consortium of six organisations and I was on that. And um, yes, we wanted marriage equality here. Um, the legislative vehicle for it to be brought in here would have been for the executive to legislate for us but unfortunately that was when we didn't have a functioning executive and an up and running executive so it was really difficult actually for a campaign because we had to keep one foot in Stormont and one foot in Westminster and they were completely different things we spotted the opportunity um, in Westminster and we actually jumped at it because I think by that stage we shouldn't have had to wait any longer LGBT people shouldn't have to wait any longer um, it wasn't our preferred option. We would have preferred legislation to be implemented here, but unfortunately that wasn't the case and it was brought through London. But you know what? See, at that stage, people just wanted to get married. And this is another, another example. Um, this was the last Pride, so two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, this is the billboard outside the Merchant Hotel. Um, we were married Two and a half years ago in the Merchant of Valentine's Day and they used our, our picture. So a bit embarrassing. Um, yeah, because I kind of work face and that. So every time you kind of looked out the window, you were looking at yourself. So yes, a, a, a bit embarrassed by the whole thing. But you know what? I say from the embarrassment, it was so important for our community and especially for lesbian visibility to say that we're here, we exist and we are getting married. Um, so yeah. That was a lovely day. So yes, that was the last, probably the last physical pride that yeah. we did have. Um, I, I love that photo too, just for the visibility. And that, I love the fact that you two look lovely in it, but I just love that, as you say, lesbian visibility, because quite often when the, even the media do show gay couples, it's men. Yeah. Um, I love that. And the very fact that the merchant is this kind of real luxury place um, that you used your, your photo too. And, as you say, tell the truth. Did you get any selfies of it? Do you know what? Yes, we did. We, everybody was saying, stand in front of that photograph. Do we take a photo of you? But I must admit, Marianne, you were probably in getting a nice cup of tea or something stronger. And we were absolutely freezing that day because it was in the middle of February, Valentine's Day and all that we were praying for was the rain would stay off. Um, so yes, I'd say you and Granny at that stage were in uh, having a nice glass of something. Oh, I think I was drinking coffee. <clears throat> yeah. So I, I do. Um, part of the, the thing when we're talking about visibility, tell me about how important the Attitude Awards was for the campaign. Well, um, this is another thing. Myself and Amanda were quite embarrassed over this and, and really humbled, actually. Um, the Attitude Pride Awards are, are such a big thing. They're in London. Um, and they contacted us. They were looking for our contact details due to the, to the campaign on marriage equality and wanted to present us with an Attitude Pride Award, completely taken back, shocked, all those feelings, you know. So they flew us over um, to a top five-star hotel, makeup artist, hairdresser, the hair, the whole top floor. And all I could think of was this would pay our rent for a year, probably in the LGBT centre. <laughs> you know, I was like, God, how much did this cost? And then the following month, we went over to the ceremony, and that was a very star-studded ceremony. Um, judge Render was the judge, or not the judge, the host, sorry, <laughs> um, on that day. But I must admit, that day, myself and Amanda took and made an acceptance speech. And at that time, Theresa May was Prime Minister, and we totally called her out. I says, it's okay saying that you're for LGBT rights. Do something about it. Why are we still fighting? To be able to get married and people at that event were genuinely shocked and, and the two fellas were crying and came up to us after it and said you know we're getting married next month and we feel totally guilty because in their eyes we were part of the UK why do we not have the same rights as somebody in London so people were were genuinely 
surprised and shocked that we couldn't get married over here and, and it was just a right if you lived um two hours away in a boat you know so yeah it was lovely you know again it was for me and Amanda but I, I didn't really see that for me and Amanda I seen it for our colleagues you know it's very much a collective effort the, the marriage equality campaign um and yeah it was lovely to get it um very humbled um and very thankful and again that that rose the profile of our campaign across the water um as well to be honest with you because we had to raise the profile in london and here that's great 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 um so this this photo <laughs> Yeah, this is love. This was a lovely day, actually. Um, this was in the roof of our current LGBT centre in Belfast. That was the day we were watching on every single TV and every computer in the building. That's when the bill was going through regarding marriage equality. So we were literally nerves absolutely shattered. And, and you know what? I just can't describe the emotion and the feeling that day in our building was just tremendous. It's actually one of the days I'll never forget. Um, people were so, so emotional that we've actually done it. And that was part of our campaign. We had to, as individuals and a campaign group, learn to be so resilient because there was so many times that you were like, I think we're going to get this over the line. And then you were slapped right back down again and you more or less had to go back from scratch. So just amazing. Absolutely just the best feeling ever. Yeah, and the people in that photograph and the people on the Love Equality Coalition were just absolutely outstanding. Cara, we, we chatted there about the the high profile or the high visibility of the Love Equality, Marriage Equality <coughs> campaign. But there was other things that you've worked on over the years that maybe people wouldn't call it a campaign and maybe it was raising awareness, um, different issues. Do you want to discuss any of those? I, I know one of the ones quite close to your own heart would have been the fertility stuff. I know that yeah. That's yeah. a thing that you hear and I do every year as part of Pride. Yeah, most definitely. You know, um, over the years, we have seen an increase in women contact and us. How do I become a mummy? Um, and how do I start that journey? And that may be through fostering adoption, through having a child yourself. But there wasn't an awful lot of information out there. And we kind of took the lead on that issue. And that kind of led on to the family work that we do now. And we have our lovely Granny Gibson in the room tonight. Granny's our young people um, empowerment officer, but previously our family support worker. Um, and the Granny has absolutely transformed the family work actually for here and in our sector. Granny's coming into your sixth year in her post, and Granny works with children and young people from same-sex families or who, children who have LGBTQ plus parents, not to 25. And you know, in our previous project, Grania worked with over 100 same-sex families really effectively. And it was that effective we got refunded again under a different stream. So I'd say something that is close to my heart is fertility rights to ensure our women have the information there if they want to progress to become a mummy. But also the family work, that's something that's really kind of close to my heart as well. I suppose historically, we also were part of the Royal College of GPs uh, working group. And that was to create a booklet for GPs when they're working with LGB and T patients. And one of the things that really used to annoy me years ago was that if a lesbian or bisexual woman goes to their GP and asks for um, cervical smear, they're, they're being told, well, actually, with your sexual orientation, you don't need that and you'll be removed from our mailing list. And that's completely the wrong information. So that was something that we highlighted and worked on quite a lot as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, I really like this photo too, but I love that tree. Mm -hmm. but go ahead. What's this one? Oh, dear me. This was, I think, the 7th of December, Amanda, last year. Um, this was a big day for us, actually. This was the day that we could convert our civil, par civil partnership to a marriage. And this was us in front of the Christmas tree in Belfast City Hall. Um, we were one of the first in the North to convert 
our uh, civil partnership to marriage. Um, we were the first in Belfast City Council. But I suppose what made it even more unforgettable was that our restrictions, the COVID restrictions were really high at this time and not one place was opened. So it was myself and Amanda and about 30 journalists after it. So we done media for a couple of hours after it and then went and got a takeaway McDonald's and had a wee McDonald's with our wee dogs that day. And that's how we spent our day because there was nowhere open and we couldn't do anything special, but we didn't need to, you know. We are in our home and with our wee fur babies. I see that there was plenty of journalists there anyway, the Thames. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what? It was in every paper, actually. And we were just looking at that going, I can't believe this as a marriage certificate. On top of it, just just completely surreal. And sometimes, it, because you were so concentrated on this campaign, you're like, can't actually believe it's near the end. You know, just unbelievable, you know. And things move so quickly towards the end. We've been at this for years, but they did move quite quickly um, at the end. So, yeah, that, that. And again, you, that's another thing when you're campaigning and a campaign so big. You have to take the good and the bad. And there was some negative media, but I must admit the majority of it was absolutely lovely. Um, but I remember my son, and I said to him, just do not respond to people online. They'll think what they want to think. But you know what? He responded to one of them and he got hundreds of likes and people were sharing it. And Rana not made me say, and he's dyslexic, so... Sometimes he would struggle, um, not so much now, but I have never seen something written so eloquently and respectful in my life. He just said, you know, you're saying that these people are going to burn in hell. And he says, well, this people, I'm totally natural, no equality until we're all equal. And that is totally, totally right. Um, but Rand said, you know, that's my mommy you're talking about, and this is my family. And he described it and articulated himself so intelligently. And the person that he was responding to, he couldn't reply to him because what could you say? He was so loving and Rand just said, you know, you probably need more love in your life. And if you ever want to engage with me discussing this issue further, please do so. And I actually think he did engage with this one wee particular man. And I think he was just a lonely wee old man and he engaged with Rand quite frequently after that about these issues so again as it shows the importance of visibility but also we can't fake this we're talking about equal rights but we we can't do this on our own we need our allies and we need our friends and our family and our work colleagues and our neighbors to help us as well along this journey carl what next for lb B women what next what campaign are you going to work on next or are you working on well, well, as the team will know in here and I, we never actually stop. There's quite a lot for the future, but I'll maybe start with the ban conversion therapy campaign. I'm part of that and I'll be part of a working group liaison with the Department of Communities Minister and Department to ensure that this is a practice that will never, ever happen again. Um, it's the most horrendous, damaging, unethical practice. And when you talk about people, talk with people about this, they're like, seriously does that really happen here and again people are totally shocked so that's the next thing um personally that I feel very very strong about that I'd be involved in but I suppose for the future um we currently have or I suppose we will have soon hopefully an LGBTQ plus strategy I was one of the expert panels in writing the recommendations for this for the department for communities so what I want to see is a full implementation of this strategy and its recommendations and appropriate funding to go with this strategy. A strategy is no good if it's just left on a shelf and there's no resources for our community to ensure that it's implemented. Um, I think Eilish is still here, one of our LGBT history volunteers. Eilish done the most amazing talk on the history of Pride a couple of weeks ago. And I was shocked when uh, Eilish said, you know, in 1993, in one of the Belfast Pride events, one of the topics was um, <laughs> an LGBT centre forever home. And I was like, my goodness, 1993. 
unbelievable and that is something that we're still fighting for today actually unbelievable that was an issue in 1993 so I suppose if I had a dream or if I had a magic wand would be a a purpose-built LGBT centre where all of our community can feel safe and they can access their services I suppose for here and I a constant job of mine is making sure that we're sustainable um we're the smallest one of the smallest lgbt organizations in our sector sometimes i feel um we're, we're kind of doubly discriminated against because we're an lgbt type organization but we're also a women's organization um, and we do not get one pick of government money every single thing that we have is through grant making organizations and that isn't sustainable you know every two or three years trying to tell staff you know what mightn't have a job in a couple of months time but I'll try my utmost to make sure that you do have a job and that our lovely people that engage with us every day are still supported so sustainability um, and again expanding our family work making sure our policy initiatives include lesbian and bisexual women and we're visible um, in policy at government level and again our fertility work and, and really increasing the partnership working with our sector partners is really important as well because we have more strength if we do things together. That's good, thank you. Pleasure. So that's all my thoughts on this over. Now I'm going to put it over to everyone else. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see if there's any questions in the chat box. <laughs> I would have had you do this. Um, <laughs> but if you have any questions, if you just put your hand up or put it into the chat box. Okay, go back up to the start. So people's just really making comments. There's a nice one from Marie and Sarah. New to Belfast and look forward to get more active in the LGBT community. Um, please get in touch with ourselves. Um, here am I. Um, Charn and Pippa from Plot Twist Film Club, safe community for self-identifying women to discuss uh, sex, consent and relationships. Most definitely. And, and you know what, here and I, it's an organisation that does support lesbian and bisexual women, but that's lesbian and bisexual women regardless of the gender that they're assigned at birth. We work with all lesbian and bisexual women and I think that's really important to say and Nigel is congratulating our first gold medalist who's trans. Amazing. Um, a brilliant soccer player, if I am I right? Uh, yes, that's correct. They were from Team Canada as well. Yeah. Wow. And yes. Uh, funny how it works, you know, pretty god. Not a single medalist at all for when did uh, trans people start participating? 2007, was it? So it wasn't all that long ago. And uh, so instead of getting something minor like a bronze, I went straight to gold. <laughs> <laughs> Happy days. And you're also admiring the words of our friend, Lyra. That's yes. correct, yes. I remember whenever she sat on stage, I don't know um, if that was prior 2017 or whatever it was, but whenever she wanted to make that statement of that whenever she came back from uh, the mainland and in Ulster, Stormont government didn't recognise her certificate of marriage, which was recognised in the UK, but not in Ulster. So she held her wife's hand and she said, this is not my partner, this is my wife. And everyone cheered. And I just thought, gosh, what brave words. And I always remember those words as well. Good, good, good. So does anybody else have any other questions or comments? I think there's one wee question there, Mary Ellen. Just daily, just what can people do to better support here and I and other LGBTQ plus organisations? It's a really good question, Elish. And I think, you know, I'm seeing Gareth and Will here. There's, there's quite a number of LGBT organisations in the north here. Yes, there are the main staffed ones, but the other ones like Queer Space are as equally as important. You know, make sure that you volunteer. You could contact our organisations to volunteer. You could see if there's any board vacancies, if you have specific skill set to join our board. You could help fundraise and more importantly, spread the word of our organisations among your family and friends and your work colleagues share our stuff on social media and I'm sure Gareth will not mind me saying that but 
you know, it's great when you see people sharing queer space, car friends, the Rainbow Project, here and I, transgender and I. It's amazing when you see, and you would be surprised when you share something on social media, who that might reach. It might reach somebody that is really in need and needs our support. I suppose I should take the opportunity also. Is Jeff still here? Um, Jeff Evans from Out in the Past. At the moment, their exhibition okay. is in the Park Centre in Belfast. I've been down on Monday and how do we look at it myself? So it's well worth the, the dander if you're down that way. Um, Jeff is. That's a, that's, sorry, that's another great example, Mary Ellen. You know, something maybe five or 10 years ago, a shopping centre in West Belfast having an LGBT like historical pop up stand. Like that, that's genius. It's absolutely brilliant. And you know, that, and again, it's just, it does my heart good. And you're going to reach people that you wouldn't normally reach. Most definitely. Nigel, you have a wee question. Uh, yes, I do. Oh, isn't it? Oh, my mute is off. Um, <laughs> it's uh, not really a question, just a wee statement. I, um, what do you call it, attended, what was it called? Uh, Love is not a sin, but I'm not sure if that was on here and I or not. But uh, the, um, the, it was our history club. It was your history club. Oh, good job. Um, what do you call it? Just to remind people, for this is just for the sake of people who are interested in LGBT marriage and whatnot. Uh, he's going to be the first ordained uh, priest, not minister, priest in the church in Sailorstown. And that's. Uh, that's a month from now on the 12th of September, and he's inviting anyone to go and attend if they want to witness that. And if I'm not mistaken, according to his words, Seamus, or Jim, as he likes to be called, said he's that's going to make him the first openly gay uh, priest in all of Ireland, not just Ulster. He Actually, the Catholic Church has stepped in, and uh, he's now allowed to have his ordination, ordi ordination now. In St Joseph's, so he's had to move it around to the Dockers Club. Um, that happened on Monday, also. Just that happened on Monday, right? Yeah. So um, he thinks it's somebody. Uh, well, whatever he, he believes, it's homophobia. Um, the attitude. Just to give you a wee bit of, just because we chatted there about the history club, as you know, I'm coordinating the LGBT. A heritage project so we're a regional project um some of our volunteers is in the room Elish, jude gareth grania um michael um so what we do is once a month we hold a history club it's usually the last tuesday of the month and that's in conjunction with linden and hall library it's generally on zoom um we held uh as part of belfast pride we done a heritage tour around the city, which was well, um, well, I thought there was a good big crowd. Margaret, if she's still in the room, was, was one of our attendees. And that's kind of looking at our, our version of our history. Um, so it was really interesting. We, Jude and myself, done a lunch and learn for Fintru last week. Um, and we're keen to do more of those for sector organisations, or sorry, for networks. Um, we're very keen on capturing people, people's stories. And this is what the evening was about, was about trying to capture Carl's story. Uh, but we're very keen to do that with people who live in the north of Ireland or those who are from the north of Ireland and had to leave um, due to their sexuality. We're planning a wee exhibition um, and we're planning to do a documentary. And we're always looking for volunteers. So if anybody's interested, please, please, please get in touch. One of the other things that we do is we run an online archive. So if you have any archival material that you'd like to loan us, we'll copy it uh, and put it online. Please, again, get in touch. So thank you for listening to that. And I thought I'd just take a wee opportunity um, to throw that in. As I must admit, Mary Ann, I, I done the application about two years ago now for the Heritage Project and it was always something at the back of my head, you know, going, must do something there because if we don't do something, our history and our heritage is going to be completely lost because nobody's really capturing this. Um, and I remember sitting down with John from the Rainbow Project and Steve from Carfrey and going, right, we need to do something. So we got the application in, but never in my wildest dreams would I have thought that the Heritage Project would have had so much interest. People are genuinely genuinely interested in it and I think that's a testament to yourself and Richard that was in the post before you you know the numbers that we get at these events are 
absolutely phenomenal. But I just think we've already lost some of our loved ones within our community and we weren't able to capture all of their lives. You know, we need to start doing this now. Yeah. Well, I think the project wouldn't be nothing without our volunteers and they do the whole drive behind it. They're amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, and I'm not saying that because you're there, I do say that behind <laughs> also. Most definitely. Can I just say, um, Mary Ellen and um, Cara, we were talking about fertility earlier on. I mean, as a woman who's now got a 20 year old son, there wasn't anybody out there at all when I was trying. I was the wrong person to be a lesbian. <laughs> so I was like, way off in the corner. Um, but, you know, I mean, I was, I sort of, I was quite open and I did share a lot of information vaguely with people I knew might want to have kids as well. But when you, I just missed, your group. I remember meeting you just before Lassie became here and I, mm-hmm. Cara. And um, I obviously I missed your group by a couple of years. But I mean, I do think it's really important that the information is out there for women. Um, not all women want to be parents and stuff, and that's grand. But I mean, yeah, the concept that lesbians can't be parents is ridiculous to start off with. So, or even by women or trans women or whatever. You know, so I think it's good that um, you're pursuing that. Um, I saw the adoption of foster one. And the fertility, I think it's a brilliant, a brilliant way to go. Thank you, Granny. And I just can't believe your son's 20, actually. Um, <laughs> I, I just remember talking to you and he was just a wee tote. But again, um, you know, people like Granny from years ago, you know, it was people like you that kind of started us on this journey. And Sally Bridge and Katrine as well. I remember starting their dikes with babes. It was a wee, uh, I suppose, a, a lesbian parting group. Probably 20 years ago or something. And they say it was themselves and a week prom. Sorry? Pablo's about 21 to 22. He's about three years older than my Sean. Yeah, and you know what? They say it was a small handful of them. So we mustn't forget people like that that were so brave 20, 22 years ago to do that. But you look, 20, 22 years ago, there was, you could count in one your hand how many women gathered together informally with their kids and we, if you look through our social media, our pride video, we have, I don't know how many women with their prams, just prams, prams, prams during pride. You know, there is so, so many and people having the kids. And, and as Gwen, you said, not everybody wants to have children and that's okay as well. That's why we have a diverse amount of events so that we try to reach out to, to every woman out there and we will do whatever we can to meet your need. But a need, Granny, most certainly we've seen, as you said, was an increase in people wanting to become parents. Um, Granny's doing an amazing job in her job um, and she engages with our family on a one-to-one basis and on a group basis. Um, but it has been an area for us that we have seen massive, massive growth. And I think it's just going to get bigger. Um, Karen Logan, you're most welcome, Karen. Karen's saying she works for the National Museums and is interested in collecting objects and stories. So if we have um, anything relating to equal marriage, family, the history of here and I, LGBT history, and the various ongoing campaigns that you can consider contributing to the collection, please let me know. Most definitely. And Karen, have a wee look on the, the Marriage Equality Facebook page as well, because that's, that's history in the making, to be honest with you. You know, um, we used to post everything up that we done. It was a very active Facebook page. I think. Sorry. Sorry. Um. I think there's a piece of um history we have here, Carl. Actually, I think we have Connor McGinn's bill, a copy, okay. in the house. So we must pass it on to you, Mary Ellen. And if if our car wanted wants to get in contact with Mary Ellen, then we're we're happy to pass on maybe a copy of that as well. If. That's- like, That's right, Amanda. I forgot about that. Um, several years ago, when the bill was in three, first reading off it in Westminster, a delegation of us went over. I'd never been to Westminster before. It was all very grand, and myself and Amanda were sitting in the, the chief whip's box, and uh, couldn't believe it. Conor McGinn got up to give a speech about it. It's his motion, and named us in the bill. So when you see the bill, both our names are on it. Was quite quite remarkable, actually. Um, to be sitting there when all that was happening. Yeah, amazing. But again, that is that is history. And I remember saying to Ryan, you know, when I'm long gone, hopefully if there's any grandchildren from myself and Amanda, 
that you know you can show that to your grandchildren that's that's history uh nigel you have your hand up Yes, uh, and no surprise because I'm the chatterbox, as everyone likes to call me in the uh, Zoom groups that I go to. Just one question that I had, um, uh, I think it was the Rainbow Project was looking for a new uh, outreach officer and ideally they wanted someone who was from BAME, so that was uh, Blacks, Asian and Minority minority ethic, uh, Ethnics, there we go, that one, I got it one. Yeah, that's what BAME stands for. Uh, one of the things that I was interested in about that is for the female groups that are interested in making sure that women are well informed for monitoring and reporting abuse. Has anything ever been brought up about something that I only found out recently and I had never heard of it before and it was called breast ironing and it was to do it. It's as gruesome as it sounds, by the way. Uh, and it was a BBC documentary that I've seen on YouTube. I've just seen it today. And it was to do with uh, uh, African women who were very, very young, but their breasts were protruding quite a bit. So their mothers uh, take view of this and say, they're too protrusive. We need to iron them with hot plates to get them reduced. And the reason why I bring that up is because it's... Uh, it's likened along the same lines of female genital mutilation, mm -hmm. which there was quite a strong amount of uh, support for trying to get it banned UK wide and as well as in Ireland. But um, because I've never heard of that one and uh, what do you call it? Um, I just wanted to know if that was ever heard of before. Just to let you know, if you didn't hear about it, that's something to maybe look out for. Thank you, Nigel. I think I think just I see Amanda here just for the information purposes. And you're talking about different types of abuse there. Um, we currently, in partnership with Car Friend, have a domestic violence project. And you know what, Mary Ellen, you're sharing this tonight. So maybe Amanda might be the best person to maybe give a wee bit of information about that, if that's okay. Yes, Amanda. Yeah, so um, as Car said, I'm the domestic and sexual violence mm -hmm. support worker for the, the sector, and I work for both here and I and Car Friend. So I work with um, LGBTQIA plus women and girls, 12 years, um, right the way up, who are at risk of or who have experienced domestic and sexual violence and abuse. So I offer one-to-one um, -one support. Um, I do training for professionals on the correct use of language on um, specific um, abuses in, in our sector. Um, and also the barriers to reporting and why people don't report domestic and sexual violence and abuse. So um, I do that training quite often. And if anybody would like me to come into your organization or um, you want to come on a personal level, you can come to any of the training sessions. They're advertised quite regularly on your and I and Car Friends websites or Facebook pages. Thank you very much. Um, uh, where can I find this information? It's just in case I find myself in this situation, be it at work or find it out in my neighborhood or elsewhere. I need to be able to know what to do and who to contact. It'd be on our Facebook page, Nigel, here and I. Um, Jude has asked a question. What can men do to be good straight or gay allies to lesbian and bisexual women? I suppose, in my opinion, and people here might be able to answer it, you know, over the years, we have worked really closely with our partners in the Rainbow Project. This is probably an example, Jude, where we work so closely together. We have a brilliant working relationship, actually, and done many projects together. But there are some things that need to be women specific only. And what we found over the years that if it was a mixed gender, maybe personal development group, quite often the women didn't really speak very much and they're overpowered by the men in the group. So that's why some of our stuff is women specific only. But I would say support us, love us, listen to us, spread the word of our issues and, and treat us on an equal foot. And I think sometimes with even within our community, there is a hierarchy and sometimes it, it is more men that you see than women. And that's why I think events such as this are so, so important to raise lesbian visibility. But do you know what? There are some amazing men out there too that they are like, I understand your feminist ethos of your organisation. I support it. 
And some of our biggest fans are men, to be honest with you, of our organisation. They're constantly sharing our stuff and supporting the work that we do. Okay, well, listen, that's a really great question to end on. I think Amanda's going to... Sorry, Amanda. Sorry, Marianne, can I just jump in there? Um, another part of being good men towards not only LB women, but all women is um, don't talk in dr- drug try terms about us. Don't let other people do and don't laugh and share um, social media posts about um, lesbian, bisexual women or women as a whole. Um, and just be kind. Thanks, Mother. Elise, do you want uh, the last question? Oh, no, I was just applauding what oh, she just said. <laughs> Well, okay, but listen, if there's no more questions, I am going to thank you all for attending this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've put the We of Violation survey in the, the group chat. I'd appreciate it if you'd fill it in for us, please. Um, and Cara, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. And again, a big thanks to Phila and Fobble, who will be re-showing this on Sunday evening at 7, I believe, if anybody wants to watch this again. Um, so, Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for your hard work organising this, Marielle, much appre- and for kind of forcing me in to do it. <laughs> um, but thank you for all your hard work. And, and it's so lovely. Just amazed at the amount of people that, that's um, turned up tonight. If there's anything here and I as an organisation can do for anybody here, please just don't hesitate to, to contact us. <laughs>